Thank you for joining us. Um, we hope you had a fantastic morning and at your previous workshops. And we just really want to thank you for sharing your Saturday afternoon with us, especially on this glorious day. Um, I know we heard that you heard about resiliency this morning, and we hope our presentation can help build on that really important topic. So before we begin, let us go through the acknowledgement of traditional lands. Sorry, Anna Lynn. Sorry. I'm having okay. technical problems. <clears throat> we would like to acknowledge that this meeting is situated upon traditional territories. These territories include the Wendat, the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, and the Métis Nation. We would also like to recognize the enduring presence of Aboriginal peoples on this land. That was such an honor to do that. So introductions. So my name is Julie Chu. I am a physiotherapist. Uh, I have been working for the Toronto District School Board for over 25 years. I am a consultant to mostly developmental disabilities programs physical disability programs. And I also am a consultant to some diagnostic kindergarten classes within the Toronto School Board. Um, we also have lots of supports throughout the TDSB. Some of you may know us as occupational and physiotherapists. Mona, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks, Julie. Um, so as Julie, I, I'm an occupational therapist consultant working for the Toronto District School Board. And those many programs that Julie has mentioned uh, previously include myself. And I'm just really thrilled to be here on this beautiful day with you to share in this special pre presentation. Thank you. Anna. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And here I am with Julie and Mona. And I'm an occupational therapist at TDSB, working with Julie and Mona and many other wonderful therapists in the same programs that Julie mentioned before. And we are happy that everyone is here today to listen to what we have to share about sensory wellness. Thank you. Okay, so the topic of sensory processing is huge, and we could probably spend days and days and days on end studying, learning, and trying to understand how fascinating our body's sensory system works and how we experience our world through our senses. But for today, we would really like you to just get a quick understanding of how sensory processing works and what it means. Then we will discuss how our sensory systems are related to our mental health, our well-being, and then discover the term sensory wellness. And then finally, we'll find out how and what is our role as parents for our children's sensory wellness. Next slide, please. Okay, so we put the slide in for some dog lovers in the audience. If one of these dog faces could explain how you're feeling right now, which one would it be? After a long, exhausting morning, I'm thinking that some of you may be like number two, fighting to stay alert. Naive, number nine, <laughs> number nine. I love that. <laughs> number five, oh yes, 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 absolutely. Like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here at this right now, right? But we are so thankful that you're here. And Naeem, number five, number nine, that is what people would say that I am like most of the time, very excitable and often bursting with glee. Uh, we would also like to draw your attention to the doggy face number four, which is that really content, just right face, ready and open for learning. Cause that's the kind of face that we would like um, to put into your memory right now. Okay, next slide. So as occupational therapists and physiotherapists, we often talk about sensory processing, processing, but what does it really mean? Sensory processing is the ability 
of our central nervous system to organize and interpret sensory information coming in from our environment in order to produce an appropriate response. That's a mouthful, so let's break it down. What does it really mean? So when we enter a space, there's a lot of information that our brain is being bombarded with. That is the input. All that information through our various senses goes to our brain, which then helps us figure out how we're going to behave, respond, act or not act, move or not move. That is your output. Most of us, we'd be able to weed out some of the information that's not important, and then we can behave in a way that the society wants us to in that moment. For example, when you're driving in your car and you notice that the volume is too loud, you immediately turn down the volume. Or you go outside on a really sunny day like today, you're going to reach for your sunglasses. Or imagine you step into a really busy classroom, but as soon as the teacher starts talking, you're going to sit down and start listening. In those examples, sensory information came in through our senses, but Sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> in those examples, sensory information came in through a sentence, the input. We reacted on that action with an output. In the same manner, when our body takes in certain information, it can actually help us to feel calm. It is what we call a body response rather than a brain response. As we understand more about how our bodies work, we know that we can react faster using our senses, such as when you touch something that's really hot, you quickly withdraw, rather than waiting for our brain to tell us to pull away our hand before it burns. Some things, or in this presentation, we'll call them supports in our space can actually help us to feel calm and get into that just right state rather than us always relying on our brains to tell our bodies to get in control. And this is the connection between sensory processing and self-regulation. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that what is in our environment impacts our nervous system and consequently that can affect the way we interact with the environment. So today we'd really like you to draw awareness to your senses and discover some tools for your own sensory wellness. Sensory wellness is a personalized experience based on your own personal preferences to help you feel calm and regulated. Once again, looking at our senses to get into that just right state, that number four dog facial expression through how our body is going to respond to our surroundings, not so much how our brain is processing. The just right state is where we like to be most of the time, feeling very calm, feeling safe, and in a place where we can learn and grow. We also wanna mention that we recognize that there's lots of other ways that regulation takes place, such as cognitive strategies, yeah, using your brain, social strategies, like connecting with others and friends. And we also recognize that there's various types of pharmaceutical ways in which we can help feel calm. So throughout the presentation, we'd like you to ask yourself, what is it that I prefer? What is it that I do to make myself feel calm and regulated and experience sensory wellness? So to begin, exploring our senses and start to give way to navigate sensory wellness, let's start by naming and identifying the five senses. So the first one, sight, what we see through our eyes. The next one is touch, what we feel with our hands, but not only what we feel with our hands, but what we feel through our skin. The next is hearing. What do we hear through our ears? What's coming in? Next one is our nose. What comes in? What smells are we smelling? And then taste. 
what's in your mouth? Now you want to know a little bit more about each of these sensory systems, right? Mona, take it away. Oh, actually, it's Anna. <laughs> That's okay. Let's uh, start with talking about those sensory systems a little bit more in depth and how we can use those systems to support our regulation. So we'll start off with the visual system. The visual system takes in what we see with our eyes and processes the sight to give meaning to an image. So thinking about um, visual stimuli or input, we'll take a look at the little guy at, on the left side who's looking at the most favorite thing for a lot of our children, which is a screen. So that gives you some visual input. We can think about what it means to prefer visual input and need more visual information to achieve a sense of just right or calm. Children who seek visual input might be easily distracted. They may need structure to help them focus and benefit from things such as visuals or visual cues. Whereas on the right side, we see a child who might represent children who seem to dislike visual stimuli and want to block it out, just like she's blocking it out by holding her hand in front of her eyes. Children who are averse to visual sensory input may not look at you in the eye or they might actually use their peripheral vision. Sorry, didn't pronounce that correctly. That's looking out of the side of your eyes at objects or, or people. And the other possibility is they may tend to fixate on objects. Let's talk about some of those supports for those of us who have visual sensory needs. So we can talk about vision, sight, and light supports. On the top left, thinking about natural light, this may be less upsetting for some of us than those bright fluorescent lights that we sometimes see in buildings or schools or in our communities. Think about opening up our curtains and shades to let in the natural light. In the top middle, we have some nature scenes. And today, it's a beautiful day to actually go out and see the nature scenes and the fall leaves and the beautiful colors. And these nature scenes can be calming. Now, if you can't get out to enjoy nature, um, you know, certainly after this is all over, please go do so. <laughs> but if you can't, then obviously there are other ways of getting it. There are YouTube videos out there that are wonderful nature scenes that seem very calming when you just have it on in the background. You can watch it. Some of you might have those TVs with the log fire at uh, the holiday season and just watching that fire crackle might be calming too. Now, looking at the top right and the bottom right, watching a lava lamp can be calming. How many of you out there find lava lamps intriguing and just, just wonderful things to watch? Now, not all of us have lava lamps. So the other possibility is using sensory bottles. Now, they make a great visual display that you can move around and are calming to watch. You can make your own sensory bottle at home simply by getting an old, clear plastic water bottle fill it with some liquid soap, throw in some glitter or some other floating objects, and you can see and watch it move around and float around and just have a calming sensation. Now, for those of us who find visual stimuli a little bit upsetting, um, sometimes it can be too much information in our visual system, and it can be alarming and difficult to focus. Think about things that you can do in your home to make visual stimuli less um, upsetting, like decluttering or organizing your home, making things with labels and putting things away. That can be re really regulating. For me, I find that it's really hard to work when there's so many things on my desk. And that's a, another you know, example of visual stimuli being overwhelming. On the bottom middle, thinking about when you go out in that bright sunlight or there's just too much that's going on in front of you, you can throw on some sunglasses to dampen the visual input. So those are some ideas for you to take away. Now, let's talk about another system, the auditory system. The sense of hearing is known as the auditory system, and it gives information when we hear a sound or a noise. The system helps us register the sound where it's coming from, the, how loud the volume is, and whether or not to respond to the sound. 
Let's take a look at the image on the left of the child that looks like he's screaming or maybe just enjoying a good holler. Um, and think about those individuals who like auditory input and seem to welcome loud noises. They might prefer auditory stimuli to increase alertness levels and help the, keep them focused on a task. These noises help the person maintain concentration and alertness levels, but they can also be distracting to other people around them. So how many of you enjoy listening to music while you work? Is it calming? Is it smoothing? Soothing? Does it get you in that just right state to do what you need to do? Well, as opposed to that, we can look at the other child on our right side with his hands on his ears and he's just looking like he's not having a great time. So when we see children who are covering their ears, some of them might be upset by loud noises or have difficulty working when a lot of other lot noises are in the background. How many of you prefer a quiet place to work? Okay, let's talk about what we can do for auditory needs. Well, on the top images, we can think about some quiet zones or quiet spaces in our homes um, or houses. And, and maybe just think about how do I carve out that place to work or just relax for a family and and ourselves. It could be just some little space in your or nook in your, your house and you just throw on a nice carpet and some pillows and that's sometimes good enough. Then you can also think about, well, I don't have the space for that. So how do I deal with the noises? Well, the bottom images kind of give you an idea of, well, if there is some noises in the background, what would be less upsetting or alerting to us and maybe trying, you know, a noise cancellation machine or a white noise machine, um, noise cancellation headphones, or even listening to some nature sounds. And for those of us who need the noise to feel calm, we can also use those headphones to listen to music or other things as an auditory support. Let's go on to another sensory system. We're going through this quickly. So the tactile system. The tactile system tells us where we were touched, what we're touching, and the amount of pressure in the touch. Our tactile system also detects localized pain and temperature. As we see the little girl on the left, she looks like she's enjoying some tactile experiences in, in the picture. Children who seek tactile input may touch everything around them. How many of us like to touch everything and how many of our children like to touch everything? They enjoy all sorts of textures and may not care or be aware even that their hands are dirty. Whereas on the right, for some, tactile input can be actually aversive. This image highlights the experience of those who do not enjoy tactile input. It can actually feel painful. For these individuals, tactile experiences might look like something that's actually hurting them, where they might avoid things such as touching different textures, getting upset when their hands are dirty, and not liking the sensation of clothing tags or seams. Let's talk about some supports for our tactile system. So here's some ideas to support your tactile needs. For our tactile seekers, Try things like sand play, hand fidgets that might be regulating. How many of you find petting your dog, I'm sure Mona would agree with this, or being wrapped in a cozy sweater and warming your hands on a hot mug soothing? How many of you enjoy the breeze on your face even when it's not hot outside? That's a tactile experience. So for those of you who may not enjoy those tactile experiences and don't enjoy touch as much, Think about things like iron-on labels or seamless clothing for those of you who kind of like hate those tags that are sticking out. And some of us might even prefer socks on our feet instead of walking barefoot. Some of us don't like the feeling on our feet or our hands. So, you know, covering those up to, you know, make the experience less of a aversive thing. So think about those things. Let's go on to the next thing, taste and smell. So these are two other sensory systems that we're gonna talk about. The sense of taste, also known as the gustatory system, signals our brain as to the flavors or of the object in our mouth. 
whatever that object is. The sense of smell, also known as the olfactory system, gives our brain information about scents in the air around us. Now, these two systems are highly integrated and work together when we are eating and drinking. Let's look at the little image on the left of the little guy smelling something that's in a bottle. Think about individuals who like to use their sense of taste and smell. These individuals may find themselves comforted by a variety of scents and taste input to get themselves in that state again of just right. Some of these individuals might even bite, mouth, eat non-edible items and sniff and smell everything around them even including other people. Do, do strong flavors or scents make you feel calm? Think about how scents make you feel. The image on the right is a really good example of how we react when we dislike a scent or a taste. Avoidance to these sensory inputs may look like limitations in food choices, covering your nose or mouth, or even leaving and running away from smells that a lot of other people don't pay attention to. How do we support our sensory systems with taste and smell? So the images on the top are for those who find taste and smell calming. Think about lavender, vanilla, bergamot, and a number of other scents that have been proven to reduce stress as well. You can get these scents through scented candles, aromatherapy diffusers with essential oils, or a variety of other scented products. For those taste seekers out there, there are many different flavors to explore, including sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Now, for those of you who find smells overwhelming, we can minimize it with no scent policies or just not wearing those heavy scents or perfumes or colognes and by simply opening the windows to allow the air to circulate or disperse the scent. So keeping that in mind for those of us who find scents overwhelming, just, you know, minimizing that for, and especially for our children too. Okay, now, Let's talk about how the sensory systems we just spoke about, we spoke about five senses, to that how they combine and provide an oral sensory input. Now our oral sensory input is a complex combination of sensory systems that receives a variety of sensory information. It can be affected by what we see, what we smell, touch and taste. Our oral sensory processing plays an important role in what we eat and put in our mouths but it also contributes to self-regulation. When individuals have the opportunity to mouth and chew, so we're mouthing and chewing, we're able to work on cheek and jaw muscles, which is organizing, and it helps us to focus. Oral input can be regulating and have a calming effect on us. Think about early development and that little baby who uses sucking to smooth, soothe, sorry, and how many of you have had those pacifiers and how it just calms the baby right down? So this is how many of us in early development learn to regulate. What about now in adulthood? How many of us eat when we're stressed? That would be me. How about you guys? Okay, let's move on to the next. So here's some ideas other than eating when you're stressed to get some of those oral input needs taken care of. So the first one is sucking um, through a straw in a water bottle. Sometimes you can have those water bottles that have a straw already attached, or you can have an actual straw. Um, sucking is actually, as with a baby, it can be soothing. Sucking thicker substances takes a little bit more work for your oral motor um, muscles. And that again is soothing and regulating. We can also try some crunchy and chewy snacks such as celery, pretzels, carrots, rice cakes, dried fruits. How many of you chew gum? Chewing gum can also be a great regulator. Sucking on hard candy. Now this is probably a favorite of a lot of our children. And how about blowing bubbles? When was the last time you blew bubbles? How fun was that? So now that we've covered all five of our senses and you're gonna remember them all, right? Let's uh, go to Mona and see what's next. 
But wait, 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 Anna. <laughs> Thank you for sharing the five senses with us. I just wanted to highlight that there are three more. Yes, three more, which equals eight in total. So just to highlight some of the three that we may not think of right away, um, they include our vestibular sense, which is our balance and movement, proprioception, which is knowing where your body is in space and our body being able to sense that. And thirdly, our introception, which, which includes our internal body sense, internal cues that signal things such as hunger, thirst, elimination, heartbeat, body pain, or feeling hot and cold, and often can be described as signals from our internal organ systems. And just to highlight too, that these are the three systems that um, or sorry, introception is a system that we do not know a lot about and we're still discovering. Next slide. So to just describe a little bit more depth about our vestibular or movement sense, this is a system that allows us to sense body or movement, body, sorry, balance and movement, and consists of detectors in our body that are the nerves within the inner ear. These nerves help tell your brain what direction you're moving in and whether your head is up, down, turn to the side, and helps our body stay upright against gravity. This is a sense that helps you sense all those ups and downs, sideways movements, especially like when you're on a roller coaster ride. These are uh, some times when individuals can, see, there are some times when individuals seek out movement and it is a need that they have and you can see it when we fidget or have trouble sitting still and we just need a movement break. Um, some may, may wanna move, jump, run, but may not be aware of some of the dangers in their environment and risks or safety um, things. Like when we see little kids who aren't aware and perhaps they run into the middle of the street, just not knowing that it's an unsafe environment to run into. The next slide. In terms of um, those individuals who have vestibular needs and require supports, some of these ideas might include um, working in standing or sitting and even lying on the carpet, on the table, um, in standing and sitting in uh, your work chair. Um, children can also be uh, the helper when they're at home or even at school. Um, they can take things to the office or hand out papers and placemats uh, during different activities, either at home or school. Um, those who crave movement while working, they, it allows them to uh, bend or incorporate different speeds or changes while they're working. Um, and some children might find regulation when going on even long drives in the car. And a good indicator is when your child or a child may fall asleep while they're driving, while, while you're driving. Um, strategies, there are also strategies for those who don't like too much movement. And we always need to remember that um, we can introduce gradual movement in a safe setting and manner, such as starting with sitting at a table or chair and rocking side to side, then maybe in standing doing the same motion uh, before modifying the surface to something that's unstable, like a swing or a balance board or roller boy, board. But keep in mind, our in-house uh, physiotherapist, Julie Chuli, <laughs> reminded me that for those who continue to have a fear of movement, or are really unsure of this, we need to ensure that they are always grounded and have a, a safe spot where they're contacting their, um, the ground underneath their feet, or they have contact with some surface to have, um, to lean up against, to feel safe and secure physically. Perfect, next slide. Um, so here we talk about a proprioceptive sense and the information from this sense comes from the input into our joints and muscles about movement and the position of where we are in space. As I indicated earlier, um, it's responsible for the information we get about the force put into our muscles and those seeking um, proprioceptive input may lean on things such as walls or other people or use 
hard pressure um, that they don't know that they're exerting when um, perhaps using a pencil, for instance, and pushing really, really hard into the surface. Um, these individuals may also may see, seem clumsy or fall frequently or may bump into walls and other objects in their environment. The next slide. Um, so the ideas that we may use to help with providing those with proprioceptive needs include, as the picture shows, uh, wall push-ups. So find a spot on the wall and just push up against it with your arms. Pressing palm of, palm of hand together at your chest like this, just to give that input of pressure. Hugging yourself so that you feel that nice squeeze or having a big hug from someone you love. Snuggling up with a book or a movie, um, like the dad and son in the picture below, um, on the couch to give you that really snuggly extra pressure and calming. Next slide. So, there's so many great benefits to movement, as we have heard. It gets your blood pumping. It awakens your muscles. Your lungs expand and contract with deep breaths. To go outside to move, and this will be calming in itself on a day like today with the gorgeous uh, changing um, colors of the fall. Movement has a bottom-up approach to feeling calm. So if you can get yourself moving and it triggers that part in your brain that releases hormones to help you feel calm and relaxed without even thinking about it. So really no brain needed, no thought needed, just the movement. Next slide. This system, um, what, what we've called interoception, is our final sense. And we're still discovering some beautiful things about this uh, sense and how, how it informs us. It's working from day one when we're born without having to think. It's an automatic and innate response to our vital organs and survival. This is a system revolving around our internal sig signals, organs, breathing, pain internally, heart rate, hunger pangs, and our need for um, elimination. Some individuals who receive too many cues from their body seem bothered, anxious, overly emotional, and the list goes on. Some may not even be aware of their internal signals and may need help to make this connection. Uh, cues needed maybe when someone goes outside and it's cold and they don't realize it and you need to remind them, put your jacket on. I do that all the time with my kids. <laughs> um, next slide. And take it away. Oh, take it away, Julie. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Mona, for that little pre talk about interoception. And definitely, we could talk for hours and hours on end um, just discovering and learning about interoception. But in a nutshell, what we wanted to say is make sure that our foundational and basic needs are being met. Each of these words that you see on the screen could be a topic of their own. Um, but we just want to mention that eat. Yes. Nutrition. Are you getting enough nourishment into your body? Sleep. Who's getting enough sleep these days? Right. Move. Just do it because definitely after you do it, your body will thank you. Hydrate. Take some water in. We all know it is essential for our bodies. And then just breathe. It's not as easy as it sounds. And we'll actually give you a few practical ways to practice by yourself, with others, and especially with your child. And it's not that we're not breathing. It's actually the quality of breath and breathing so that we engage our core and our diaphragm that is important. So. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about deep breathing. Um, did you know that it's actually directly related to how calm we feel? Deep breathing, once again, it sounds so easy, right? But it's actually not. Um, the majority of people, especially in this day and age, we actually need to feel, we need to see, we need to hear, and sometimes almost need to smell it to do it right. Our children, and especially a lot of adults these days need to be explicitly taught and practice this with more purpose and more um, 
with more purpose on a daily, daily basis. And it's also the easiest way to strengthen your core muscle. Because uh, as you take a deep breath in, you're actually waking up the inner core and the inner core, which is made up of lots of small muscles. When we engage our core, we actually come into an automatic alignment and that frees up our diaphragm and allows us to take in a deeper breath. Then as the diaphragm expands, it connects with a very important nerve. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. That important nerve is called the vagus nerve which then releases a calming hormone and also puts a, the break on your stress hormone. The vagus nerve, that's the primary connector and communicator of the brain to the part of the nervous system responsible for relaxation. That's why people who do yoga appear so strong and calm. A yoga one, instructor once said, a happy vagus nerve is a happy human. A happy human is a happy world. Pretty nice, eh? Yeah, I think so. And yes, absolutely, shallow breathing does not allow this to happen at all, which is the way that we all seem to be running these days. So some practical ways of ways that we can practice deep breathing. Sorry, I'm just gonna... Sorry. A little bit of distractions there. Uh, a couple of ways that we can practice deep breathing. I love lazy eights. Uh, what you do is you start in the middle and then you breathe in around the loop. And as you cross the middle, you breathe out around the loop. Then you repeat. Cross the middle and breathe out around the loop. If you can do this five times, it is so amazing for your health as well as your inner core. And if you do this using a larger hand motion, you're actually crossing midline of your body and that in itself also has some great brain benefits. The other way that you can do this is you can lie down by yourself, with your child, with your partner, place an object like your favorite stuffy or even just your hand and watch that object or your hand rise as you inhale and go back down as you exhale. This is also called belly breathing. How many of you take part in this on a regular basis? Just a quick show of hands. Great. Okay, um, now a little bit more, oops. So now let's return to our sensory system and let's do a quick wellness check. You can do this with your eyes open or with your eyes closed. If your eyes are open, what are you seeing? Is it bright? Is it distracting? What are you hearing? Is it loud? Is it nice and silent? I'm hearing telephone ringing, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> What are you smelling? Is it tapping into your interoception of hunger? What are you touching? Is there anything in your mouth? Is anyone sucking on candy right now to stay awake? Where is your body at and is it still? Or are you sitting or have you had to take a movement break? Now let's check in with your breathing and your heart rate. And I invite you to think to yourself, how am I feeling? And now thinking back to your morning, uh, what did you do this morning to make you feel just right? What were the things that you did to make you feel that gave you just that little bit of joy, right? Sometimes we think about going for a quick walk that totally taps into your vestibular and proprioceptive system. Taking a drink of coffee, that's your taste and interoception. Did you take a quick shower to get you going in the morning? Or did you listen to music or listen to the news or check your, check your Facebook messages? Cause that's what you do on a routine basis to make your day start well. Or did you simply, I know Mona did this, pet and snuggle with your best furry friend. Uh, in the I think we're running a little out of time, but we would love for you to think about that. Think about what your needs are. Think about what you've learned so far about your own sensory needs and how you're gonna build that into your sensory wellness. Okay.
Now that uh, Julie talked about us as sensory beings, we can think about ourselves as tools for sensory wellness for our children. Let's think about what do children do to self-regulate? How do they learn how to self-regulate? Well, infants and children learn to self-regulate by the regulated adults in their environment. The term co-regulation involves adjusting your behavior to upregulate or downregulate the other person. So either heighten their uh, sensitivities or lower their sensitivities or their regulation states or their arousal or alertness states, however you're familiar with sort of self-regulation. Calm and engaged interactions lead to co-regulation. Now, when we think of some of our children, they may always require their parents to co-regulate with them. And they need healthy adults, and sorry, adults to model healthy regulation. So really, what does the slide say to you? Um, we all know that our children learn from adults who model behavior. So as parents and caregivers, we can teach our children how to regulate through modeling. When we're calm and fully present, our interactions with our children can lead to co-regulation. Some children who haven't developed those skills of regulation may continue to require their parents to co-regulate with them and to continue to model healthy regulations. So basically we're there for them to help them regulate. Think about how you feel when you're interacting with someone who's anxious. So when that person's really anxious, how do you feel? Does it make you feel anxious too? It does for me sometimes. Just a little bit more about uh, being that tool for sensory wellness for our children. Beyond our own sensory needs as regulated adults, we can help our children through understanding their sensory preferences. First, let's figure out how our children's preferences are by doing some detective work. Their preferences may be a mystery to start, but we might wanna figure out what do they like? What don't they like? Try different sensations out. Keep note of what feels just right and what seems to be upsetting for your child. Secondly, our role as parents or caregivers is incredibly important. Again, that we are that co-regulator, remembering we're models of good regulation and providing that co-regulation when it's needed. As our children learn how to use tools um, that build skill for self-regulation, we need to show them how we use those strategies ourselves. And when we're successful at regulating, we can co-regulate with them. So here's a great depiction of our relationship with our children when it comes to regulation. So as it says, when their storm meets our calm, co-regulation occurs. Remember, a calm parent begets a calm child, and on the flip side, an anxious parent begets an anxious child. Now let's do another wellness check-in. This time, the wellness check-in is about our children. Let's think about how are they feeling? Consider their eight sensory systems and how they feel in terms of their environment, what's going on. What do they see? What do they hear? What do they feel? What do they taste or smell? And what movement makes them happy? And since we don't have a lot of time, we're not gonna unfortunately talk about it too much, but let's go to the next slide, Mona. Okay, thanks, Anna. Uh, so let's pass on this next slide. Just we take a quick glance and uh, look at the things that we can control in our lives and the things we cannot control, but take more of a focus on the things that you can control and really try to work on those things. Sorry for the purposes of time, I have to go through this one um, quickly. I just wanted to make sure that everyone was still self-regulating and okay. Um, let's go to the next slide, Anna. So I just wanted to make sure that we were able to wrap up and reconnect with everybody. Um, this slide, um, if you can just glance at it and read it, um, it says, if today gets difficult, remember the smell of coffee, the way sunlight bounces off a window, the sound of your favorite person's laugh, the feeling when a song you love comes on, the color of the sky at dusk, and that we are here to take care of each other, most importantly, and that we need to just remember to slow down and remember that we are there to connect with each other, to um, validate, um, and to 
just ensure that we are all healthy and that we can focus on those things that we can control in our lives. The next slide, Anna. So here's a beautiful quote shared by Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So again, coming for full circle, reminding us of what brought us to this conference today and why we are here today. We're here to affirm, belong and connect with one another. So let's ensure that we can indeed achieve our own sensory wellness through an understanding and affirming one another, being open to promote belonging and finding time to laugh and connect with one another as the mainstays of helping each other while promoting sensory wellness for all. Thanks guys. Thanks Julie and Anna. Anyone have questions really quick? We are so sorry we had to zip through that, um, but we did put our emails on this uh, last slide. If you wanna try to take a quick screenshot of it or something, if you have any questions, comments, or anything that um, maybe sparked, sparked some interest, feel free to give us a quick email. We did put two resources down that we thought would be helpful, um, Self-Reg, How to Help Your Child. And the other one is a website that just helps to explain sensory processing. So thank you so much for attending. Enjoy the rest of your day. Get out there. The sun is still shining and the fall leaves are just spectacular. So get out there and uh, experience some sensory wellness. Thank, thank you. you for your thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.